Welcome to the May 4th, 2021 budget hearing. Uh, I need a motion to call the meeting to order, please. Motion. I need a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, United States of America and to the and Republic for which it stands. One nation, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, and justice, justice for all. <laughs> hey, folks, who started responsible for their own emergency exits tonight. <laughs> where you are. <laughs> uh, <laughs> approval of order of agenda, please. Motion. I need a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Um, we don't have a clerk's report tonight, correct, do we? That's correct. No, I don't have a report. Uh, public comment speakers will be recognized who wish to address the board on agenda items only. I think we're good for now, right? We are. Yeah. All right, then we will start with Mr. Clemenson and Mr. Luce. Okay, good evening, everybody. So, uh, Mr. Springer, opening the budget hearing um, at this point. Um, this is an annual activity that we go through. Uh, typically, it is held on the um, at the May business meeting, which is held on the second Tuesday of May. However, in COVID times, the mail is slower um, and, you know, with more precautions in place. And um, there is a legal requirement that the budget notice, which is also known as the six day notice, um, has to be in homes at least six days prior to the budget vote, but can't be mailed until after the budget hearing. So typically that's fine. That goes right in the mail the Wednesday after that meeting. But um, we wanted to give ourselves the extra week in order to stay compliant with the legal requirements for the um, uh, for the budget vote. So um, we have, um, I'm going to share my screen here and go through a presentation uh, tonight with the budget with Mr. Luce, and we will go through this um, fairly succinctly, and uh, it will sound familiar to those of you who were with us at the April meeting, um, or a number of community meetings that have taken place over the last few weeks, uh, talking about the budget, what's entailed in it, and um, how it relates to what budgets have looked like in the past. At that point, We'll use the comment feature um, on YouTube for those watching to submit comments or questions, and then we will address those and uh, then close the hearing. As always, um, the district office is available if you have any questions or concerns between now and the budget vote or anything non-budget related at any time, of course, as well. So tonight I'll start with a, a quick overview of the state budget, the revenue outlook improved. And so it was largely a positive budget, much more positive um, from Albany than I've experienced in my career, but also more specifically, more positive than we anticipated it being for this year. Um, economists have said that the, um, outlook, the, the post-COVID outlook uh, would not look, economic situation and economic outlook would not look th as it did in, in pre-COVID times until potentially 2023. Uh, so we went into this school year not only expecting to have a flat budget, increase, a flat budget in Albany, but potentially a 20% funding reduction um, by Governor Cuomo, as he indicated throughout the summer and into the fall. Uh, the re outlook changed on um, the economy. A number of sectors uh, did improve. Long Island does indicate, uh, Newsday indicated this week that one in six businesses did fail uh, during the pandemic. So certainly that is not universal across the board, but overall the economy maintained its strength and is coming back faster than anticipated. Therefore, um, we saw a record increase in state aid and education funding, a $1.4 billion increase, a significant investment in full day pre-kindergarten, as well as state funded property tax relief and an $8 billion investment in New York um, in the, with uh, President Biden's American Rescue Plan. So uh, all of that meant a considerable amount of additional state and federal funding coming to Hampton Bays. As we've said in the past, if every dollar that is spent in uh, that comes 
to the school budget from Albany or Washington is one that property taxpayers don't have to pay. So we're going to talk about that a little tonight as well. So the positive no news is that um, we received significant increase in state aid to the tune of $2.1 million and federal aid to the tune of $1.9 million. Um, that um, plays into um, some good budget news for us as we go into the 21-22 school year. Mr. Luce will, will talk about that. That said, so that's a good 21-22 school year investment in schools. One of the frustrations of public education and public school finance in New York State is that um, we have a limited ability to have multi-year financial projections and multi-year financial planning. To some degree, we can do it because we know what the property tax levy will be. We know what we received in state aid the previous year, um, and, and we don't often see reductions in state aid. So you have a sense of where you'll be, but it is. But a year like this, where there's such an investment in state aid and federal aid, one of the things we want to be sure about before we expand program, before we address further address the tax levy, we want to make sure that these investments at the state and federal level will be long term, that they'll be sustainable, that it isn't a one and done. Because if we were to start a program with new monies that have come in or make long term commitments, and then next year that money is not available, then we are then taking back our commitments that we've made to the community and to children. So the revenue projections in New York State give us considerations that we have to keep in our mind that this increase in the budget in Albany is a result of an expansion of mobile betting, the legalization of marijuana, and personal tax increases on the wealthy. So an increase in taxes on um, $1 million for individual filers, $2 million for joint filers, an increase of almost a percent for the money that is earned above one and two million, new tax brackets for, for um, income earners over five and 25 million, and corporate uh, business taxes that have increased as well. All of that is set to bring in revenue, but at the same time will expire in three to five years, depending on um, the tax, the specific tax package. So we know there's a shelf life on that already. So that it gives us a little warning signal to go into this next era of fiscal funding um, carefully. Um, so we wanna see what will happen with federal funding in Washington to see if the state tax increases have a negative impact on New York State, what will happen of the New York City economy, and as we move into post-COVID, what will happen in a mobile economy, in a mobile workforce where we have lots of folks working from home. There's a Supreme Court case, New Hampshire versus Massachusetts, that challenges how states can, income, how states can tax the income of workers who now work fully remotely. So uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the future. We're not scared, we're not, it's not a doom and gloom scenario that we thought it might be, but it is one where we need to remain cautious. So when we shift to what the school budget proposal looks like for this year, it's largely informed by, uh, by what's happened in Albany and Washington, DC. So I'll turn to Larry for this next slide. Thanks, Lars. Um, one thing we can be certain about is the tax levy increase for next year is zero. There will not be an increase in the school property tax levy, 0%, zero percent, zero increase in dollars. It'll be exactly the same as it is this year. We actually feel taxpayers will see a slight decrease in school taxes, school property taxes. Due to um, the assessed value of the district changed by about $22 million, and that was all due to new home construction. Uh, Southampton didn't reassess properties at all this year. So it's not like, well, you know, the, the tax rate went down, but the value of my hop, uh, house and property went up $100,000. So I'm still going to end up paying more. That's not the case. There was not a reassessment. So the, the change in the assessed value of the district was strictly due to new home construction. And we believe most taxpayers will see a slight school property tax decrease. Um, obviously, the 0% increase in the school tax levy is below the tax levy cap, which would have allowed us to, to go up to 1.12% uh, in tax levy increase for next year. 
And all of this is due to, um, as Lars was talking about, that, that big change in state aid, the foundation uh, formula change. Um, the proposed budget for next year is a 3.8% increase to a budget of 57.3 million. Uh, again, our tax revenue from the local taxpayer and from the CPF pilot is going to be exactly the same. It was 48.2 million or 48.3 million this year. It'll be 48.3 million for next year. Our local revenue we feel will be pretty much unchanged. We don't get a lot of money in local revenue. There's some small tuitions from, from other school districts that send kids to our school for, for particular uh, special ed programs and so on, some rental of, of facilities. Most of the, the local revenue comes actually from premiums on, on our borrowing, on our TANS. But it was about 472000 this year, probably be pretty much the same, 472 next year. And it's that state aid number that really is our big revenue change. Um, we projected to get about $6.4 million this year in state aid in 2021. And as you can see from the chart, we'll, looks like we'll get about uh, 8.5, almost 8.6 million, or uh, over a 2.1 million increase in state aid for next year. And that's strictly uh, or largely driven by that foundation formula. That allows us to increase the budget from our current budget this year of 55.2 million to the budget projected next year of 57.3 million and do it all with state aid with no new taxes whatsoever. We also are, are being told by the state that we're gonna receive additional funds for pre-kindergarten grant. Currently, we've been getting about $89,000 a year for pre-K. Um, that's been the case for about 10 years now. And the projection for next year is we'll get just over $310,000 for pre-K. And we're learning a lot about how the state wants that spent and what restrictions they've put around it. For example, it must be full day pre-K. We can't use that additional 221,000 for half day program. We have to come up with full day program. Um, there's also some other restrictions on, on what the state expects. So it's, it's going to take a little bit of work to put together how to do that, but we want to be able to introduce a, a pre-K program that um, uses the grant money, uh, meets the needs of folks in Hampton Bays, and still meets the state's requirements. Next slide, please. So to look at it graphically, um, if you look at the uh, chart on the far left, this is the tax levy increase year to year for the last 10 years. And 2011-12 was the last year before the state tax cap went into place. And you can see that the tax levy increase that year was just over 5%. Since then, tax levy increases have been in the neighborhood of 2%. The average actually has been 2.02%. Um, but some have been slightly higher than two. Some have been just a little bit higher than one. Uh, looks like uh, 16, 17, it was just about 1% straight. But if you come to next year, the proposed tax levy increase for 21, 22, you'll see there is no bar there because the tax levy increase is zero. There will be no tax levy increase. Likewise, if you look at the chart on the right-hand side, the budget increases. Uh, back in 11-12, the, the budget increase was only about 2.5%. And year to year, the average has been just about that, about 2.45% or about 2.5%. Next year, the, the budget increase is projected to be 3.8%. So... How can this work out? Why does, it, why does it work that the budget can go up so much, um, but the tax levy can be zero? And as, as Lars said, and as I was explaining in the previous slide, it all has to do with the state aid 
and the percentage of the state aid in relation to the budget. So if you go back to 2011-12 using that same 10-year gap that, that we were talking about previously, you can see that in 2011-12, about 9% of our school bud budget was funded through state aid. And over the years, it's crept up a little bit at a time, um, sometimes gotten close to, to 12%, probably 11 plus. But on average, it's just barely been 12% or just barely been 11%. Next year, that big increase in state aid for 2021-22 is 15% of our budget. And that's really what allows us to be able to um, um, have the, the budget, but not have to increase the, the tax levy. Great, thank you, Larry. Um, it, it is a testament to our elected officials who really fought and prioritized foundation aid as a, as a priority um, to increase. Hampton Bays was markedly lower. Um, when you look at um, why, to, to, to just expand on what Larry shared, how did the budget go up but the tax levy remained flat? It's that increase in foundation aid, which is New York State's definition of what it costs to educate a successful student. So um, the cost to educate a successful student uh, becomes the foundation aid. And beginning in 2008, the foundation aid was never fully funded by New York State. So the formula would generate an amount of money based on your consumer price index changes, regional cost factors, local need like poverty, English language learners, students with disabilities, uh, and uh, other factors like the local abilities, the local ability to pay, like district property value and other um, per pupil income weight. So a very complicated formula. It would generate that there was a number that your school district should receive uh, from Albany and was never fully funded. So as the years went on, the formula generated um, a higher and higher number that um, Hampton Bay should have received in state aid, but the state funding level never caught up. So last year, this current year that we're operating in right now, we were 41% fully funded for foundation aid. Most of the, uh, most of Suffolk County, Eastern Suffolk County, it was at or close to 100% fully funded, but our formula just took off as, um, as our free and reduced lunch population grew and our district's property value um, sort of stayed where it was after the 2008 economy, uh, Great Recession. So we were owed about $10 million from the state each year in state aid. We were getting a little over $4 million. So Assemblyman Thiel has made this a, a, a priority of his, and Senator Shelley Mayer, who chairs the Education Committee in the Senate, uh, really brought this over the finish line as well. So there was a catch-up provision. So anybody under 60% fully funded was brought up to 60% with the intention of fully funding the foundation aid formula in the next two years. So we are at 60% now. Next year, we would be at 80%, and then in year three, be at 100% fully funded. That would be a great scenario for Hampton Bays, but we're just not sure, given the, the last 13 years of history, we just can't write that check yet. We can't be certain that that is going to happen. It's written in the budget language, but it could be written in the next budget language that that is not the case. So that's how the legislative process works, why advocacy is so important. So we thank our Board of Education members for maintaining those open lines of communication with elected officials. So we recommend that conservative approach to holding taxes flat. This budget allows for a 0% tax increase and an additional infusion of revenue that allows us to handle some one-time expenses. So um, in 2012, the Board of Education and the community made a significant investment in the facilities. We did a number of pro 70 projects um, that that handled some crumbling infrastructure, some neglected infrastructure from previous generations, and really have the campus physical plants in a good position. Um, 
the the investments that we've made in maintenance and um, operations allows us to do regular routine maintenance, not defer maintenance and find ourselves in a generation again, repairing things that have been neglected. So with the infusion of uh, additional revenue, there are six items that you can see on your slide there that would be one-time revenue expenses um, in case the increase in foundation aid for, uh, foundation aid from the formula does not sustain itself. We have not made a promise to the community that we then have to take back or a promise to students that we then have to take back. These six items are not all nice to have. Uh, there are some enhancements here, including a renovation of the locker rooms, um, softball and baseball infield work, um, but there are a number of repairs and maintenance that need to be done on the, both the Ponquag and Argonne campuses. If they were not going to be done in this budget, the Board of Education would hear a recommendation from me at some point to consider another bond because these are items that need to be done. Um, and a bond is an additional tax implication for taxpayers. And so the fact that this infusion of aid exists right now allows us to do that without an additional tax impact to uh, community members, which is a great thing. The budget does include three additional staff members um, across the district. One is a full-time maintenance mechanic who would be um, responsible for day-to-day -day maintenance in the, on the facilities. Uh, so that's not custodial, but our maintenance uh, building on, at 74 Ponquag Avenue um, is where that maintenance work happens, defers a lot of big work. Uh, it prevents a lot of big ticket maintenance items because it's regularly being attended to. In instruction, uh, the instruction section of the budget, you'll see that uh, there's an increase of 2.4%. Um, and that includes two full-time English, uh, full, two full-time English as a new language and Spanish language positions. Um, as a result of enrollment um, of English language learners and kids who need those services based on state regulation. Other driving factors in this 2% budget increase include the increased cost and quantity of advanced placement exams. AP exams started yesterday and movement of technology equipment purchases from a debt um, as in lease payments to a general fund purchase. Um, and then the big uh, spending increases in the capital debt, capital benefits, capital projects, benefits, and transportation line where you see those one-time capital expenditure expenses taking place. Um, so the budget is largely a maintenance budget in that there are a couple of staff increases, our programmatic increase, our program offerings as we come out of COVID um, and we look at some um, as we look at getting back to normal again, include some curricular initiatives like news literacy media or news media literacy, excuse me. Um, I know Mr. Carlson is watching now. He is working with Stony Brook University um, to have Hampton Bays become one of its flagship partners in teaching kids from grade seven through 12 how to consume information in the information age and how to be uh, critical consumers of information, of what's misinformation, what's accurate information, how to navigate 21st century media um, and news literacy. Um, in addition, we have a computer science program at the high school that we're gonna continue to build out um, as we focus on K to 12 STEAM and um, technology, math and, and engineering. So a lot of the things that were important to us coming into the pandemic will remain important to us to keep digging and keep investing in. Those don't, in, those don't in, uh, require any expansions at this time, just digging back into that work um, as we put COVID uh, behind us. So I'll, I'm gonna pivot to the May 18th school budget voting information and I'll, I'll hand that back to Larry. Thanks, Lars. Um, last year, as you, many of you know, uh, budging, budget voting was a little bit different uh, due to COVID. Everything was through absentee ballot. This year, you can still use an absentee ballot if you choose. The website to uh, get the application for an absentee ballot is right on our school website. Um, you go to HB Schools, the community section, and voter information, and you can get the application for your absentee ballot. And New York State just passed a law that COVID is a valid reason to say, I want to get an absentee ballot. I don't, I, I'm afraid of getting exposed. I don't want to be exposed. Therefore, I want to vote absentee. No problem. You can do that. 
for those of you who are comfortable and want to go back to the old way, the, the way we did it for years with voting machines and voting in person will be May 18th, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. in the middle school gym, which is where we've been voting for the last 10 years or so. Um, COVID precautions will be taken. You will be required to have a mask on. It doesn't matter if you've already been vaccinated or not. Um, we will have hand sanitizer. And if you want to have gloves, we'll even have disposable gloves available and we'll wipe things down and so on and so forth. Um, you know, hopefully uh, through the, the work that the hospital has been doing, um, the, the work that the school has been doing, and, and all the vaccinations uh, centers uh, that are available, more and more people are getting vaccinated. But if you want to be safe and you want to be sure, you take precautions, and, and that's what we're going to do. We're just going to take precautions to make sure everybody goes, votes, is safe, and, and their vote counts and there's no bad side effects from COVID or, or something else. There's three propositions on the, the ballot. And the great part about talking about them is there's no tax increase for any of them. Proposition one is the school budget. As Lars and I explained, the tax levy increase for the school budget is zero. It's exactly the same as it was this year, not a penny more. Proposition two is to authorize the school to use up to three and a half million dollars of money that's already been reserved to replace the elementary school roof. Uh, last year in the spring, there was a heck of a windstorm and part of the elementary school roof actually peeled back. At the time we spoke about it in front of the board, it was able to be repaired but when the roofer did the repair, he said, this, this roof is 20 some years old. You're gonna have to replace it pretty soon when we, we can repair this, but you know, if it happens again or happens a couple of times, we're not gonna be able to repair it. You're gonna have a problem. Back in 2019, we asked the voters if we could set up a roof and HVAC reserve. And uh, that was approved for up to $5 million. And we've been funding that reserve each year since. So we have the money to do the roof. We've saved it. It's, it's there. All we're asking the voters for is the authorization to now spend from the savings account to do the work we plan to do back in 2019. No new taxes to do the roof at the elementary school. And the last proposition, number, proposition number three, is to authorize the, the district to use up to $300,000 of undesignated, unreserved fund balance. So that's money left over from this school year, from operations, for repairs, renovations, or upgrades. And these are things like um, uh, two years ago, we did the high school library, completely gutted it, cleaned it up, new carpet, new paint, new ceiling, new lighting, air conditioning, et cetera. We, we ask for this proposition. We've been asking for it each year because as Lars said, we like to address the, the maintenance and upgrade issues as they come along rather than defer them, wait for them to build up and then have to come to the voters and say, could you, could you float us a bond for X number of millions of dollars so we can fix everything that's been neglected for five or 10 or 15 years. Again, this is money that's already in the budget this year that wasn't spent for whatever reasons. And so it will result in no new taxes to authorize the use of $300,000 from this year's budget. There's um, two seats available uh, on the Board of Education um, to the top vote getters. Uh, three people are running for those, those two seats, Ann Culhane and Liz Scully, who are current board members, and Rich Ianelli, who is a teacher in our high school. Um, dates to remember that are important uh, over the next uh, two weeks. Um, obviously, the, the, Lars mentioned the budget newsletter and uh, the six-day budget notice going out and so on. Um, 
Two, two key things, uh, last day for the clerk to mail an absentee ballot or to register to vote is May 13th. So please, if you want an absentee ballot, make sure that the, the clerk knows about it soon. If you haven't registered, please get into district office or, or talk to the clerk to register. And then May 18th is the vote. Uh, please remember that's uh, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. in the middle school gym. And June 15th would be a second vote if needed, but we don't want to talk about that because that's not a good day. So we'll we'll just move on without that even discussing that anymore. Um, are there any questions about the, the budget or anything we've covered tonight that we could answer? I'll keep an eye on the chat here for a moment or two. We have a number of people watching. Um, any any doesn't look like we have any questions, uh, but we are, I'll watch that and I'll just say again, um, it's important that we get folks to come out and participate in the vote, uh, whether it's absentee or in person. Um, there'll be a budget newsletter that goes home in addition to the budget notice. Uh, and then there's contact information on there if anybody has any follow-up questions. Budget materials are also available at the public library and on our website. There are no questions or comments at this time. So Mr. Springer, I believe you can close the hearing. Thank you, Mr. Luce. Thank you. Okay. Um, before I close the meeting, I just want those who are listening and watching that we do have a quorum that you just are not able to see everybody, but we do have a full quorum of board members, some who are not shown at the present. Uh, with that, I need a motion to adjourn the meeting. Motion. I need a second. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all as usual. Enjoy your night. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Thank night. You. Thank you. Thank you, Lars.